We've been in a series the last couple weeks about the five choices we make that shape our lives. Um, but I've missed two out of those three sermons, and so I really don't know what John's been talking about. So we're going to push pause on that series, <laughs> and we're going to do kind of a tangential random other sermon this morning. So this is not part of the series, although if you want to find, I'll throw in the word choice somewhere, and maybe we'll make it work. Um, so if you have a Bible with you or can reach one, um, turn to 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 4. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. It says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we all were baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Will you pray with me? God, we ask that you teach us through your word this morning. Teach us more about who you are and who we are in you as your body together. In your name we pray. Amen. I love a good personality test. Things like Myers-Briggs or Strengths Finders, I love them. I have this kind of weird fascination with how they can kind of parse different parts of me and I love to sit down and figure out what I think they got right and what I think they got wrong and what I should be a little offended by and all of these different things. I love taking these tests and I've taken all kinds of them. I'm an INFJ in the Myers-Briggs which means that I care deeply about people and I love deep and long-lasting relationships and I'm, I'm guided by my emotions a lot but I hate things like small talk and parties with all kinds of people that I don't know, those are exhausting to me. That's my Myers-Briggs. And all of that is kind of confirmed with my strength finders, which tells me that my two biggest strengths are empathy and harmony. So again, I like relationships and I, I like to walk alongside people, whether they're going through good times or hard times. But I just want everyone to get along all the time. I don't like conflict. I like this idea that we're all in the same boat, and it's not a bad boat, so let's just sit in it and not rock it, and we'll all be okay. <laughs> my, my DISC assessment, I don't know if you've heard of this one, DISC, D-I-S-C, was my least favorite one, but it was interesting what it told me, because it talks a lot about how you deal with information and break things down. So apparently, I like to have things systematized, and I like lists, and I like to take a big goal and break it down into little steps, and I have very, very high closure skills. I like to get the details nailed down. So you can imagine, if you know John very well, he does not like closure. <laughs> so you can imagine how staff meetings go sometimes. I, my, my least favorite staff meetings we have at the harbor are the ones where we talk about a great idea and we just let it hang there. I want action steps. I want things that we can take it to the next level. I like those details at the end. There's even a test out there called the APEST test, A-P-E-S-T. It stands for Apostle, let me see, I have to get this right, Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Shepherd, and Teacher. And this is designed to help pastors understand their leadership style. So I apparently am a shepherd apostle, which means that I like to walk alongside people and help people understand how their faith interacts with their lives. And then I like to send them out to go do something about it. I don't want to just have people sit there and know things. I want you to do something about it. So that's, that's what my APEST test taught me. So I'm sure we could go on for hours about this. I've taken so many, and I love each and every one of them. And I'm sure you all could talk about what your Myers-Briggs is or your strengths finders or whatever. We have all these kinds of ways to assess who we are and what makes us tick. 
We've developed all these different ways to understand why we act the way we do and why someone else acts the way they do and how we can communicate and work together. And so in the church, we've, we've adapted this idea to a spiritual gifts assessment. Now, if you grew up in the church like me, you probably took at least five or six of these in high school, and they, they talked about you have the gift of prophecy, and that was always the really cool one to have, and you have the gift of hospitality, which was kind of something you told people when you didn't know what else to tell them, and, and all of these different kinds of things. We've taken this idea of something like the Myers-Briggs, and we've adapted it to the spiritual gifts. So our passage this morning is one of the passages that those assessments are based on. Towards the beginning of our passage, there's this nice little list of, of nine things, nine spiritual gifts that we can have. You see, we know that God has created each and every one of us a certain way, that he's given gifts that the Holy Spirit can use to work in and through us to follow God's will. There are certain things about us, certain character traits or skills or talents or likes or dislikes that God can use to develop his church, to build his church. And God uses those things in this church, at Harbor Church, in our workplaces, in our schools. He uses them for his kingdom. Those are our spiritual gifts. And that's what these assessments are trying to help us understand. So I've been in churches that take this passage that we read this morning as, as a sort of menu, right? There's this list of nine things, and these are the nine options you have of, of what spiritual gift you might have. And I know Christians who have obsessed over this list and tried to figure out which of the nine you have, and sometimes they get really depressed because none of those nine fit them, and sometimes they get really excited because maybe they'll have the gift of speaking in tongues, or maybe they can interpret something, or one of the really kind of cool, funky ones. There have, there have been whole books written about this list of nine gifts. In fact, as I was getting ready for this sermon, I ran across a book that spent a whole chapter dedicated to telling you why there are, in these nine gifts, there are three categories of gifts. And he went back to the Greek and said all these things that didn't make any sense. To, I've taken Greek and I've taken Greek exams and all those things, and I don't know what this guy was talking about from the Greek, but he determined that there were three categories of gifts, and everyone has one gift from each category, and there's this whole kind of divine algorithm that this guy made up that, that tells you why your gift might be from category A and not from category C, and someone else's might be from B and not from A, and it was way overly complicated and really confusing, but he boiled this whole passage down to just those nine gifts and how to figure out which one's yours and why that works or doesn't work for you. But see, I'm not sure that this is what this passage is all about. Yes, of course, God gives us gifts. He gives us things that he can use to do ministry through us and in us together. We all have ways we can best serve in the church. Some of us love to pray and prayed hard and diligently for others. Some of us are great at hospitality, even though that's sometimes the thing we just label someone because we don't know what else to tell them to do. But some of us really are good at hospitality and welcoming people. Some of us have this great ability to comfort and encourage others when they're going through a difficult time. We have these gifts, but I don't think that this passage was meant to be a menu. I don't think it was meant to be an exhaustive list of all the options that might be there for, for what our gifts could be. Instead, I think he was writing to encourage us as believers to use those gifts that God has given us. The point isn't what we have. The point is what we do with what we have. 1 Peter 4 verse 10 also talks about spiritual gifts, and it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You see, this isn't an issue of just finding out what your spiritual gifts are. This is an issue of stewardship. How are we using those gifts that God has given us? Even the Greek word for gift used here kind of suggests this. The, the, the word in Greek for gift is charisma, which means something else in English now, but in, in the Greek, it meant gift. And it comes from the word charis, which means grace. 
So you can kind of see these gifts that God gives us, these spiritual gifts, are gifts of grace to the church. When we use our spiritual gifts, they are means of infusing grace into someone else's life. So when you welcome someone into your home, you are giving them grace in their lives. When you pray for someone, whether you're praying for healing from a disease or giving thanks for a new job, you are asking God to give grace in their lives or your own life. God has given each one of us a way to show that grace in one another's lives. We have each been given a gift, and it's not a gift that God intended for us to keep to ourselves. It was designed to be given away. I love how Romans 12, verses 6 through 8 puts it. It says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. I love it. So, matter of fact, if you have a gift, use it. Just do it. It's as simple as that. What's the point of having a gift if it never gets used? God gave us each gift, and he wants us to give them away. And what's more, we've all been given our particular gifts for a reason. Well, we were in Malaysia these last few weeks. Um, I heard a pastor talking about his experience as a Christian going to college in Malaysia. Now, you have to understand, Malaysia is a very Muslim country, predominantly Muslim, and so the Christians who are there have this really strong sense of the need for evangelism. There's this kind of a sense of urgency in in wanting to tell others about Christ and share their faith. So this pastor was telling the story of how when he was going to college in Malaysia, surrounded predominantly by Muslims, and he made it his goal that by the time he graduated, he was going to tell every single person he met about the gospel of Christ, and he was going to convert them all. Everyone he met was going to be converted. And so he, he read this passage, and he looked at that list of nine gifts and said, okay, today When I meet this person, I'm going to pick the gift that I need and ask God for it, and that's how I'm going to do this. So he met one person and thought, okay, I need the gift of knowledge for this guy because I really need to make some strong academic argument so he can make sense of God, and then he'll believe. And then he meets someone else and say, now for this one, I need the gift of miracles because I really got to wow him into heaven. And then he met someone else and thought, okay, for this one, I really need the gift of faith because he is putting up a big fight and I need to keep my own faith intact. And so he took this menu and decided, this is what I should have for lunch, and this is what I should have for dinner, and he kept piecing it all together, depending on who he was talking to that day. Now, it kind of, it kind of sounds like a noble thing to want to do, to try and figure out how to best share the gospel with the people you meet. But what this pastor said he realized was that he, he was always looking for something better than what God had given him. Rather than spending his time finding out what his gifts really were and trying to develop them and use them and be faithful with them, he was trying to, to direct God instead and say, this is the gift that would really be better for me right now. God, this is what I should be using. And he, he, he was missing what God really had in store for him. He was constantly looking for the right gift at the right time, and so he was never looking for what God really wanted from him in that moment. See, we're called to use our gifts faithfully, not to ask God for something we think might be better for our purposes. We're called to use our gifts for God's purposes. Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 13 says, So Christ himself gave apostles and prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. God gave us the gifts that we have for a reason. God gave us gifts so that we can build up the church. They're given to us to equip us to serve God and to serve others. 
They're given to us so we can all be unified and mature in our faith so that we can grow together as God's church. God made us the way that we are, and he gave us the gifts that we have because they're part of who we are. And so if we're constantly asking God for a gift we think might be better for what we want to do, we'll miss the ways that God wants to work through us. If we're always looking for ways we might need to be different for our own purposes, we'll miss the ways that God created us to be for his purposes. And because we've all been given spiritual gifts, these gifts give us a sense of unity. Even though we're all given different gifts, God gave them to us so that we can build up his one church. In 1 Corinthians, our passage this morning states over and over that we all have different gifts, but one God. Different gifts, but one giver, one spirit who gave them to us. We read in earlier that there, there are many kinds of gifts, but all of them come from God. In verse 13, it says, For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit. We have different gifts, but we all serve the same God, and we're unified in that. We use these gifts to build the church together. This is a team thing that we're doing. Our gifts might be different, but our goal is the same. And we need each other in our different gifts to build God's church together. So one of us may have the gift of prayer, but someone else has the gift of evangelism, and someone else has the gift of teaching, and someone else has the gift of saying that right word at the right time, and we need all of them for this church to work. In our passage today, Paul uses the image of a body to describe the church. And he says, just as the body needs hands and feet and eyes and livers and brains to be alive, so the church needs people who pray and people who preach and people who hang out with the kids on Sunday mornings for the church to be alive. We all have gifts. And we're all necessary for the church to function. So what gifts do you have? Maybe you've taken one of these spiritual gifts assessments, and maybe that's how you know, or maybe you just have kind of a gut feeling of what you're good at and where you can best serve. But I invite you this week to to look at what gifts you have and where you might be able to serve. What are those characteristics or talents or skills that God has given you that he can use to build his church? How are you being faithful with those gifts? How are you using them to to help build God's church, to follow God's will? As we go forward in this new year and into the next phase of life for Harbor Church, whatever that might be, I invite all of us together to look at what our gifts might be and to think through how we might be able to better serve God and serve his church. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for your gifts to us. We thank you for those skills and talents and, and things that you've infused into our lives that we can then give grace to others. God, we ask that you give us the strength and the courage and the faith to find those gifts and to use them for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Will you rise as we sing our last song?